I'm Keith McCollin. Welcome to another Real Conversation. It's my pleasure to have Alan Gannett here, who wrote this book, The Creative Curve. So this is, uh, this is something that some of you may be aware of because we've been highlighting it in the early look. What I like to do is, you know, of all these books that I'm reading, I try to pick something, you know, from it that, that we can relate to the process that we're trying to implement and find somebody who's an expert in a subject matter that probably isn't where I have any expertise. But what I like to do, Alan, and, and, and I'm interested in your feedback on that, is really think about the world that way, which is try to think about like what are best practices, what are good disciplines, what is good process. And I thought your book was fantastic in, 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 in really highlighting that across a very wide swath of conversations that you had. I don't, I don't know how many you had, man, but there were, there were a lot. Uh, and, and I don't know how many you actually left out. But um, maybe just start with that. Like, is, 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 is that really you know, the, the fulcrum point, if you will, of that book, all the, all the conversations and insights that you had from them? Yeah. So first of all, by the way, like I feel very like left out of the vest game now. That's a great <laughs> vest. I'm going to invest in some cool Patagonia. Um, so fundamentally, the book is about this question of how are certain people so good at creating the right thing at the right time? And this is across art, business, music, whatever it is. And so I looked at this question and what I wanted to do is draw upon academic research, so looking at psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, but also interviewing people. So I interviewed 25 living creative greats, ranging from like David Rubenstein on the business side to folks like Pasek and Paul, who've won Grammys, Tonys, Oscars, sort of all that kind of stuff. And what's interesting when you look at all these people is that we think of these people as having this like magical, mystical ability. In reality, all of them are like diligent followers of a process. And sort of more interestingly to me, most of these processes kind of rhyme with each other. And that's mm -hmm. where I think we can learn a lot about how we can develop skills really across any field. And, and, and you started, I mean, you started the book with, uh, you know, you basically called it the lie. You said like, well, what you yeah. thought about all these people, it's just a lie. And that's kind of my yeah. style. I like, calling, I like calling out received wisdom or the establishment for these types of things. You know, can you maybe just explain that? Like, wh why is it just a blatant lie? Yeah, I mean, like, think about some of the folks that when you say the word, like, creative genius, you think of. It's like Steve Jobs is one of the ones that pops into mind, Mozart. Yeah. And, like, Steve Jobs, the sort of, like, popular notion of him was this guy who, like, did this all by himself. Like, there was no one else who worked at Apple. Like, he was designing everything. He was building everything. And, like, that's we know that's not true, right? It's like he was this sort of marketing, PR, sort of magazine sort of cover. But, like, the reality of Apple was, like, day one he had Steve Wozniak. Uh, they raised venture capital very early. They had multiple employees. And so we have this mythology around creativity, which is really what's sort of told to us by sort of comms teams because it's a better story. And I think for a lot of people, that acts as an obstacle. Because you see that and you're like, well, I'm not that. Like, I can't do everything at Apple by myself, so I shouldn't even try. When in reality, like, that's not even true. And, and movies are also problematic. I mean, like Mozart, for example, we think he wrote like concertos when he was like six years old because we watched the movie Amadeus, which says he did that. But like, that's not true. That's a movie. <laughs> and so I think a lot of people don't give themselves permission to try to get better at certain skills because we've really internalized this sort of public mythology, which is just which is just garbage. Well, th this is where, you know, you're singing my song because uh, not only are you uh, super interested in pattern recognition, uh, but you're interested in you know just saying that uh, a mucker like me can create potentially a better way, right? And that's um, and most importantly, and and we'll go through this because there are you know there there are laws that you basically outline, and 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 having a community that's collaborating, um, you know, there's so many different components of what that of what we're doing here that really fit like a glove. Uh, into 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 that in that paradigm, like the whole notion that people are are all going that you have to be Warren Buffett to be brilliant in this business, or you have to have gone to one of these great schools and had perfect SATs. It's just not true. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just not. And what I'm trying and to help people do is believe that they can teach themselves, but also understand that you're going to have to grind. Like you have a lot of work to do, and um, I try to start with that. Well, one of the things you talk about that I really like when you talk about the process or with a capital P is that there's all these studies in pedagogy about the difference between practice and deliberate practice. Yeah. So practice is like just doing stuff, right? <laughs> and the problem is, is when you look at studies of stock pickers, for example, years of experience stock picking isn't necessarily correlated with success. What's correlated with success in almost any field is something called deliberate practice. And the difference between practice and deliberate practice is like, Practices like in basketball, you would like play a game. 
And you would become more and more subconscious as you did that. But the problem is in order to get better, you have to prevent yourself from getting fully subconscious. So deliberate practice is where you take a macro skill and you break it down into smaller micro skills in order to keep yourself more conscious of those skills and you work on improving those fundamentals. So what they find, whether it's in music, whether it's in business, any of these fields, is that your hours of deliberate practice, that's what's actually tied to success. So when I think about stuff you do, like for example, with all the journaling, those are all forms of deliberate practice. It's not just about experiencing the world around you, but it's about touching it, feeling it, and being very deliberate with how you interact with it. Mm -hmm. It's also, I mean, it's, it's the genesis of fractal geometry, like why the particular matters more than the average of things, not the valuation of things. So when we talk about you know, my world, which is investing, you know, that's, that's the point that a lot of people really aren't even aware of, I, I think. I mean, it's not like uh, Mandelbrot is new, but you know, when you think about this, that's, it's that particular thing, if you're studying it deliberately, that you will notice, but only if you're doing it all of the time. And, and, that's, and, and I can't understate like, how tough that is. It's a grind. It's a bloody grind. You have to have a, you have to have a team. I mean, I, I think you have to have a team. At least I do. I, I wasn't born you know, with the capacity to, to think up all this stuff on, on my own. Um, but, but also, you, 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 you reviewed this in the book within the lens of kind of like pop culture in terms of the 10,000 hour rule. And you know, maybe talk a little bit about that in terms of like where there's, again, people wander or, or look to that and say, well, okay, well, he, just, he, he or she just did a lot of it, therefore. Yeah, so this is the 10,000 hour rule, like, like kind of gets my blood boiling. Like this is my <laughs> trigger word because like, it's really become one of these maxims that people have internalized where like, you can do anything if you put in enough time, which is a very like optimistic thing but the issue is that the 10,000 hour rule says if you do anything for 10,000 hours, you can become world class at it. And there's two problems with it. So it comes from this research by a researcher named K. Anders Ericsson, who's a very famous academic. Yep. And what his paper actually said was that it's not that you can become world class at anything with 10,000 hours of practice, it's that it was 10,000 hours on average across skills. So certain skills take more time because more people have done them, right? So there's more competition. The other thing is that it wasn't just hours of practice, it was hours of deliberate practice. So they actually did a study of violin students and they found that the violin students who merely did lots and lots of practice, they didn't actually get better. It was the ones who did hours and hours of deliberate practice, where again, you're breaking down the macro into the micro and really getting good at those fundamentals and letting the bigger picture sort of emerge more naturally. And so that's one of those things where I think so often we hear these things like, okay, if we put a lot of time into it, I and mean, maybe just throw ourselves at it, when in reality you need a deliberate process, you need a deliberate system in order to get better at it. So like painting, for example, if you went to art school, there's this whole exercise you do called brush efficiency, where you literally will paint a brush stroke on a canvas, and then you will try and replicate this same exact brush stroke. And that's teaching you about pressure, about color application. So it's not just sitting there and like painting stuff, but actually really breaking down the macro into the micro. I love that. I mean, everything in life, and this is why you know Dan Holland and I were talking about the, what kind of conversation he's like, Keith. What are you going to talk to this guy about? He doesn't. He's not a markets guy. I'm like, that's that's entirely you know not the point. And he said exactly. People need to understand that there are interrelationships uh, of success that are common. You know, and that's um, it's a wonderful job you did with that. And I like how you're highlighting a painter or Paul McCartney. I mean, that's how actually how you start the book, where people just think that this. Is, well, he actually said he did wake up thinking about the song, and it was a dream or whatever. But how long did it take for him to write that song? <laughs> yeah, two years. That and was, the crazy I, that thing was amazing McCartney. to me. Yeah, and the crazy thing with McCartney is like people are like, well, he like dreamed up music. Like that's something he was famous for. But like, not only did he just dream up little fragments, but like he spent his entire world surrounded by music. Like he played in a cover band, he listened to music his entire childhood. So yeah, like what's like ricocheting around his brain is music. So yeah. he dreams about that, but like he doesn't dream about like new stock picks, right? Like what goes <laughs> in is what comes out. And so like actually one of the things I talk about in the book is that consumption is a huge part of most creative processes because how our right hemisphere processes information is it synthesizes disparate things together but you actually have to have stuff in there, right? Like in order to connect the dots, you have to have the dots to connect. And so fundamentally people sort of are like, where did those ideas come from? It's like, he listened to music for like 20 years of his life, you know? 
Mm -hmm. and, and the song yesterday, which I should have mentioned, by the way, uh, you know, he, he, he at no point actually knew what it was going to be. That's the best part yeah. about it. I mean, he was brooding over this damn thing, and his teammates were getting annoyed with him. Everyone was getting annoyed with him. They, they, like, and eventually he got to the point. I feel that way a lot, where because I have to show people <laughs> my daily brooding. You know, I can be a moody guy. You know, sometimes I'm, you know, just whatever, on tilt a little bit. But, you know, try it. I mean, try, try writing it down every day and communicating what the hell's going on in all of global macro markets and having a bunch of people ask you questions all the time about it. I mean, he didn't have that many people asking him questions about it, but they were really, they, they were annoyed with him, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, his, the rest of the Beatles at a certain point were like, can you like hurry up and finish this song? And so even though we think of it as this example of like being struck by lightning, like that's not actually what happened. It is a story of like a little bit of lightning and a lot of hard work. Yeah, that's great. And, and then there was another part in the book, um, and then we'll just get into kind of the mechanics of how you think, think this through uh, and what you came up with and which, you know, there's creativity not only in, in terms of your creative curve, but how you explain it. Um, you know, there was another part of the book, and I'm, and I'm failing, my memory's failing me, that, that, that thought of, it was a songwriter who, who thought in threes. You know, uh, you know it, was, it was actually the construction, the nature of constructing a song that made him successful. So this is one of the things which is like really interesting to me about creativity is that we think of creativity in forms of like radical newness, like radical novelty, like things that are really out there. But that's like kind of garbage. Like the reality is, think about, I always like the Apple example. Like Apple in the early 90s tried to create a tablet computer, it was called the Newton, and it was a spectacular failure. Fast forward to today, and the iPad is a huge business, but if you look at how they got there, it was very iterative. Like the iPad was an iPhone without a phone, the iPhone was an iPod with a phone, and the iPod was a better MP3 player. So what you find when you start looking at successful ideas is that they tend to actually be a blend of the old and the new, of the right. familiar with the novel. We don't actually like things that are radically new. And so like I give the example in the book of pop songs where like there is a certain formula to what we like in pop songs. And like you could argue whether that's a good or bad, but it also just is. And so when you talk to pop songwriters, the thing that they're focused on is not reinventing the genre. It's about taking some of the core elements of the genre and adding a new or novel twist to it. And you see this across all forms of art, like Star Wars, literally a Western in space. Like that's actually what it is. Uh, Harry Potter is the most straightforward orphan rising story, but they're wizards. And so I think what a lot of people get wrong with creativity is they think they have to reinvent the system. And in reality, we can talk about why, what consumers actually want is they want something that's sort of familiar enough to be safe and accessible but novel enough to drive interest and intrigue. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's interesting about that to me is when it gets back to markets, is that people are, are, are there's an allure to the, to, the, to the old wall, as I would have called it, their way. And I have to fight a lot you know, to explain what I think is a better way. Now that's tough because the familiarity really isn't there. You know, like when I start talking you know, fractal geometry, I've basically lost a lot of people with, with those two <laughs> words. Whereas if I said, hey, look, I, I, if I just called it a moving average, they'd probably be listening a little bit more intently just because that's what they're familiar with. Now, so what is it about uh, industries? And by the way, guys, show slide five. You know, this, this is actually where your book fits in my learning curve. Um, in my learning curve, I try to learn as much as I can. I, I, every time I read a book, I realize what I don't know, which is a lot. Mm. Um, you know, so on the left side there, you know, the triad in my process, my learning process is history, math, and behavioral psych. Or, so, so your book to me, like you say, hey, look, this isn't a marketing book. This isn't me, the CEO book. This is, this is, this, this is my book, and I, I would call your book a behavioral book. I mean, so mm -hmm. in, in my bookshelf, that's where it fits, and that's why it's absolutely pertinent uh, to building or on the edges refining, like I always try to do Hedgeye as, as a company and my process. Um, but that's where, and, and on, the other, on the right side is, is what the old wall does. They, start, they think the, the center of the earth is valuation. Uh, it's almost like thinking, thinking of the earth as, a, as the center of the universe. Uh, they think of this, it's different this time. So I really try to compare and contrast the two, but I gotta tell you, man, I struggle sometimes, you know, just because it's, it's unfamiliar. It's, it, I made it up. I mean, there, let's just start with that. <laughs> well, and that's the thing that I think is so interesting is that as humans, like we all say we want novelty. We all say we want newness and innovation. But in reality, like we like like comfortable things. Like we like things that rhyme with something else. We like going back home after a vacation. Like there's something very safe about all that. And what's interesting is that all comes back to evolutionary biology. So this is why like 
if you think about like when you ancestors were hunter gatherers, like if they saw a cave they never went in before, they'd be like, that could potentially kill me. Like I could die if I went into that. <laughs> so instead they'd be in a cave they already went to, a familiar cave. Yeah. But the issue then for us when we're marketing ideas is that when we're marketing something new, whether that's a process, a product or a business, the thing we have to think about is how do we bring in that level of familiarity? So that can be literally having features or functionalities from something in the past, but that can also be metaphors, right? And like you talk about the metaphor, which I really like, which is like, we're essentially doing a macro hedge fund, but letting people see it, right? And so that's a metaphor that helps people understand what you're doing, because that's not actually what you're doing, but it allows people to sort of visualize what you're doing and get that metaphor so they have that familiar element. So I think when you think about any sort of business, for example, a really important thing is, is their product not only novel and innovative, but is it familiar enough to still be accessible? Yeah. Well, so this is now I want to get your coaching. So now you're, you're coach. You're, you're already anybody who writes a book that I read and take this many notes is coaching me. Let's just be clear. <laughs> uh, the thing about people in life, particularly on Wall Street, Alan, is that they, they love to learn, but they don't always like to acknowledge who taught them. You know, but it's okay. You know, it's it's like I'm proud of uh, having you on the show and, and being having you coach me. So so when when I look at the creative curve, I don't know if guys if we have a picture of it, um, uh, it'll be harder to it, like it's easier to as you just pointed out to visualize it. But you know when you go from where my company was, which is fringe, to the sweet spot or the hockey stick on the curve, you know. How, how much, well, first of all, it took me 13 years to do it, so I know it can take a long period of time. It doesn't happen by creating an app. Um, you know, it, <laughs> it, it, it could take a long time. It took me a long time. Um, I think I'm in the sweet spot right now, and I'm concerned that I'm going to go to the wrong part of the curve, which is you're cooked. It's over, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the curve is basically this idea that scientists, the academic term for this curve is, and it's a really terrible term, is the inverted U-shaped relationship between familiarity and preference, which is like a terrible book title. So every brand <laughs> like much better. And it's basically this idea that when you map out how familiar something is with how much people say they like it, you end up with this turtle shape. Where like in the beginning, when something's like really, really new, people are like, what the heck is this? And then people start liking it more as they get more exposed to it. And then eventually they get bored and they start wanting new stuff. And so when I talk about creative genius, what I talk about is really that some people are able to get in the sweet spot of this curve where they consistently create ideas that are familiar enough to be safe, but with a little bit additional exposure, they quickly rise in popularity. And this is where like big companies get in trouble, for example, because they'll see a trend and rather than realize that, oh, this trend is doing really well. So by the time I come out with my own version, I'm going to be too late they try and replicate trends. When in reality, you want to take ideas that are in the fringe that are really promising. And so fundamentally, whether it's in marketing a specific campaign or marketing a product or a business or a methodology, whatever it is, the thing you need to think about is where do I fit in that curve? And so what my book sort of goes into is how can you develop the skills to create ideas that are in the right point of the curve at the right time? And, and, and how long, I mean, I, I think I know the answer. I mean, when you study growth companies, for example, and people love them um, or they love them until they you know, hit their all-time bubble high, but it's not like Google is going away. You know, stock can go down. But what they do is they remain in, they've remained in the, in the sweet spot for a long period of time. You know, the length of time you can be on that curve, and I don't know if you saw, but uh, the team just popped it up there. Um, you know, the, the amplitude and the, 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 the length of time, time and space spent in the curves got to vary wickedly. So this is a great point. So there's a couple footnotes to the curve, which I think are very valuable if you come from an investing perspective. So one is addictive products aren't subject to it, right? This is why Starbucks is a great business because like fundamentally people aren't going to get bored of caffeine. They can't. Um, products that reduce exposure either through distribution or pricing power. So luxury goods essentially stretch out their curve over long periods of time. And then network effects are another sort of objection to the curve, where if something has a sort of built-in or powerful network effect, you can essentially stop people sort of going through that. So really this curve is particularly applicable to any sort of consumer trend. Mm -hmm. So like where I think this stuff is really interesting is think about like um, the adoption of a product like Peloton. Yep. Peloton benefited in large part 
because spinning had had this resurgence through things like Soul Cycle and Flywheel. So the idea of spinning at home, it wasn't a double jump. It wasn't, I'm gonna get into spinning and I'm gonna do it at home. It's, I'm gonna do the spinning I'm already doing at home. And so fundamentally, the thing where this is really applicable, I think, when you think about it from an investing perspective is any business that has a consumer trend element to it, that's where it's really, really important to understand this. Yeah. Um, so let's go, let's go through that, like the, the, the four laws, as you call them. The first one, consumption. Um, we'll just knock them down. We'll kind of do it briefly before we go to questions. But I think it's consumption, then imitation. We'll do uh, consumption first. Yeah, so there's these four patterns I found. So I interviewed these 25 creative achievers. These are like Oscar winners, billionaires, mission star chefs, you name it. Yep. And what I found that was interesting was there was these four things that all of them did, all 25 of them did. So the first one was consumption. So I tell the story in the book of Ted Sarandos, who just got promoted to co-CEO of Netflix, but he's been chief content officer for 20 years. And what's interesting is you know, he's a college dropout <laughs> and he started his career as a clerk at a video rental store. And he actually watched every single movie in the store. And that to him was this like foundational experience because so much of his job is understanding where ideas are on the curve. And so consumption plays a huge role because if you want to understand where ideas are on the curve, you have to actually have seen what's out there. Yeah. So like jazz musicians listen to like every single jazz record. Like that's a fundamental part of becoming a jazz musician. So consumption is one of these things where I think it's kind of like a dirty word. Like, oh, you're not doing anything. But actually the best creators are also like obsessive consumers of specialized content, like in their niche. They're not on Twitter. You know, they're not learning a little bit of a lot of things, but they're going very, very deep in one. Yeah, um, I, I think that that, I mean, for me at least in my own experience, I mean, I wrote my senior thesis at Yale on, on Buffett and, and what a short selling strategy would look like for him. It's way back, huh. right? I'm taking myself back to like 1999. <laughs> But I've, I've read, I'm not kidding you, I've read, I think, every single book there is uh, of relevance on investing and then started reading math more and then more history and get into the behavioral stuff. And to me, that's when it became readily apparent that, you know, I guess it should become readily apparent when something doesn't work, that there might be another way to do it. Uh, <laughs> and what I ended up finding, and this is, I don't know if this is constant with the conversations you've had, but there's a, it's, it's much more reasonable for somebody of the scientific field, the mathematical field, to believe what I'm saying than somebody from Wall Street. And it's, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm either crazy probably, uh, but they're definitely wrong in a lot of different things. And I think that that's, to me, that's what it was. I had to consume all of it first. Yeah, I mean, there's the uh, human emotions get into these areas and that's where I think it's always so interesting is you always have these like, these sort of non-methodical sort of bubbles or events happen. And I think when you take a step back, you know, I don't work in finance, right? So like when I see a lot of stuff in finance, like I think about it from a different lens. And like, I think about what's going on with like SPACs right now. It's like SPACs have been going on. Like they were legalized what, like three or four years ago. Yeah. And like Mark Ein created the first few, like I used to live in DC, so I'd heard about him. And like, but now all of a sudden everyone and their mother is like raising a SPAC. And like, we all know how this ends, right? Like fees start going down, less people do them. There's some big crashes. like and people will get over that. And like, these aren't hard to predict. I think the thing that's difficult is that when you're actually in it, it's very hard to sort of abstract your emotions away from it and be very rational, especially when it's your money, right? Um, so consumption is really, imitation is that I think gets the most people sort of caught up because when we think about creativity, I think the idea of imitating feels almost like sacrilegious, like how could you do that? Yeah. But what's interesting is that because creative success is about that tension of the old and the new, it's really, really important to actually imitate some of the old. So you think about like yeah. uh, novels, right? Like novels aren't trying to tell how to tell a love story. They're telling a love story in a new way. Think about the amount of you know fiction or movies that are essentially you know Shakespearean tragedies, but they're telling it in a new setting or a new dynamic or new characters or any of this. Fundamentally, so much of creativity is actually about imitating the old but adding in that novel component. And so the thing I like to tell people is you want to focus on imitating the structure of past success. Yeah. Not imitating the content of it, but the structure of it, right? Like how does a story flow? How does a movie flow? What does an effective business model look like? 
Yeah, that, that, to me, like, I have no problem saying that I've imitated and basically copied, you know, what Benoit Mandelbrot taught. The problem is that Wall Street didn't, you know, so that's actually <laughs> the difference. One believes in nonlinearity, embraces uncertainty, the other believes in linearity and certainty. So, I mean, there, it's, it's, I absolutely stole that, borrowed it, imitated it. And, and then I, saw, I read Ray Dalio's principles, and I'm like, I'll be damned. This guy's had 1,400 <laughs> people back test what Darius Dale and I have known all, all since we started this place, which are the rates of change, back to slide five, the sine curve of growth and inflation are the two most causal factors in asset allocation, sectors, again, full investing cycle stuff. So, you know, I like to think, and I always say this, I, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, I stand, if I stand on those three pillars, math, history, and behavior, let's just start there, then I'm in a very safe place. Where I'm in a really bad place is if I come up with a slide deck on why I have two stocks that should go to 100 and I own them at 20, and if they don't, I don't have a business. That's totally different. I mean, that's, that's not a process. So, so to me, yeah. I, I like that, the, the imitation part. Uh, two people you mentioned. One is one of my, um, my heroes, uh, Benjamin Franklin. And, but you also, <laughs> you're you oscillating between Bev, I think the, the I don't know, she was some kind of romance novel or what was she write? Uh, and, and Benjamin, how did you do that? Yeah, so I talk about in the book, um, the story of this famous romance writer and romance writing is actually pretty interesting because it's so formulaic, but yet they still sort of move the ball along. I and I that. tie in the story of Ben Franklin who talks about it in his autobiography, how he learned how to write. And like, we think about Benjamin Franklin as like this like great writer, right? But when he was 18, he wrote some letters that his father found and his dad was like, yo, Ben, this is terrible. That's how he talked at the time. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is really bad. And Ben felt all this shame. I like how I'm calling him Ben. Ben felt all this shame and he was like, I am determined to learn how to become a great writer. How he did this is he literally took his favorite magazine and he basically created like a mad lib of how they built their arguments. And then he would come back to that outline a week later and he would rewrite the articles based on his outline. Then once he got good at that, he actually like tore up his outline, reshuffled it, came back and tried to recreate the entire argument and the entire article. Because he realized like his job is not to like reinvent how people like to hear effective arguments. His job was to learn how to tell his own arguments with that structure. And that's really true across all creative fields. That, that makes, to me, that resonates big time. I and mean, you're talking to a guy who had the lowest SAT score at Yale. Not kidding. That's not a joke. Really? Uh, that's a fact. I had a, my, first pay, my first paper in English Lit uh, Yale year one was deemed ungradable and sent to the Yale hockey coach. Okay? Like, I don't know how much worse you could be on the curve of who had competence to write from that institution, but you wouldn't be betting on me. But what, but what happened to me was I had to write every day since I started to hedge eye. So what happens when you write, I literally write, what I, I don't know, you've read my early look, right? I mean, how many words yeah. is that? 500 to 1,000 words every day for 13 day. years, then I'm not that bad anymore. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the thing is also when you start consuming and reading a lot, and you start to see like how are other people writing, what are their techniques, that naturally then also flows into your own work where you start to like, you start to reflect those things you're learning, what you like and what you dislike, and right. you become better. Yeah, well, you, you also become better by explaining your process because everyone in the community, and they think this is point number three, um, uh, the creative community aspect to it. You know, to me, if I didn't have my, if I, I'm sandpaper, my community provides me sandpaper. If they don't push back wine, compliment all of it, then I don't get better. You know, that's a, yeah. that's a really valuable thing that I have, which is doing it out in the open air. Yeah, and so this is one of the things where like the mythology of the solo creative is so poisonous because I think people think like, oh, like either A, I have to do it all by myself or B, I'm going to do it all by myself, both of which are bad because in reality, like the best creatives are very, very focused on having people around them who push them, who inspire them, who teach them, who hold them accountable. So you think about like your, even your company, right? Like you don't know, maybe you do, you don't know how to operate like a camera and set up like a crazy live stream. And, but like you hire people who do. And fundamentally part of your product is knowing what you're good at and what you're bad at and bringing people in to support your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That's the big differentiator. So many people, when they go into creative endeavors, they wanna work with people who are similar to them, who are like them, who they gel with. And in reality, the best creatives 
are very self-aware about what they're bad at, what they're weak at, and they bring in other people, sometimes a lot of people, to support them in those things, to push them in those things, and to help um, you know, basically buffer them from those things. Hmm. That, I mean, I, I, again, like, and no, I don't know how to operate the camera. Uh, you know, Mark is behind it laughing right now. Uh, and it, it, it's, 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 it, you know, being, like, I would have never thought that I'd have a media platform. I mean, I, <laughs> are you kidding me? I mean, absolutely not. Uh, the, the fourth thing, the fourth thing, which I loved how you use Ben and Jerry's, because not only do I consume it, as you can see, my chubby face, but you, I think you started with uh, chubby hubby, actually, in the book. Um, <laughs> And I was, I was, I went, again, when you read about success and then you, and, and then you kind of got to the point, I was like, no shit, that's how, the, how they do it. Yeah. So maybe just yeah. kind of recap that for oh. people. Yeah, so the fourth law is um, iteration. So we, we often think about creatives, like we think about them like going to a cabin in the woods by themselves and writing the next great American novel. Like that's the sort of mythology in our head. But in the reality, whether it's in consumer products, whether it's in art, whether it's in writing, whether it's in music, whether it's in film, what you find over and over again is what separates the elite from everybody else is the elite because they realize that their job is not to create the best thing that they want, but to create something that their audience is gonna resonate with. They're very focused on getting audience feedback into their process yeah. and then iterating on their product to make sure it's in that sweet spot of the curve. So I talk about with Ben and Jerry's, like they've had this like, I think it's almost 40 years now of being <laughs> this brand that's like, still viewed as like having good sort of brand credibility. They're very innovative, all the zany flavors, all the stuff. And like you would think at a certain point, they'd get very confident, right? They would just be like, here's what we're doing. But what I talk about in the book is that they spend most of their year literally consuming food trends, alcohol trends. They read menus, they go to different uh, health food stores. They'll go to like different cities to explore what are the local food trends. They take all of that try to think about, okay, what are ideas that we think could get into that sweet spot? They come up with written descriptions of flavors, 200 of them, and then they send out a survey where they chop up that list of 200, and they ask people for each flavor idea, one, how likely are they to buy it, and two, how unique it is, mm. which is basically how familiar and how novel it is. And from that, what they're doing is they're trying to get that right tension where they don't just want how likely are you to buy it, because if they just asked that, it'd be all chocolate, brownie, caramel, cookie, whatever, right? <laughs> and so the reality is they want that tension of familiarity and novelty. And that's how they've been able to stay so consistently within our culture and keep growing their revenues, even after they got bought by Unilever and even after they've reached you know, such pinnacles of success. Yeah, tension, I love tension. Markets implicitly <laughs> have tension. I love tension, I love volatility. You know, these are the kinds of things that really, you know, they keep your, you know, they keep the glue with your audience. And, and that's, that's an important thing. Um, if you go, if you just kind of like, you know, take all these discussions that you had, and, and we're going to go to the Q&A, by the way, if you have questions, we have a bunch of questions already here, um, Alan, so we'll, we'll start asking other people's questions. But my last question before we take their questions is this, like, I'm not going to say, well, who's your favorite, you know, interview, but I mean, who's the one who like borderline shocked you? Mm. Like who's like, I, this is, I thought I was going to have this conversation and it's kind of like this conversation. I don't, I, when I first picked up your book, I wasn't quite sure. Like most books, I'm like, I don't know. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised and I, I and, and I think it's getting better as we're having a discussion that happens <laughs> to me a lot in life. And there are a lot of people on the hedge eye platform that people had no idea who they were. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, where did that dude mm. come from? So who, who, who was the person that, that shocked you? So for me, it was actually um, David Rubenstein. Really? Like, I My old boss. Him. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I knew him. I knew of his legend. I knew all this yeah. stuff. But what I found was interesting is, you know, I think he was 68 or 69 when I interviewed him. And we like met up for tea. First of all, he was like responsive to my cold email, which I thought was intellectually interesting on a level. And instantly within 10 minutes of the interview, he started trying to ask me questions about like the stuff I knew. And I realized I was like, this guy is like, infinitely curious, even though he's like, you know, he's a billionaire, he's on the 25 boards, he's still viewing this interaction as an opportunity for him to learn, which that was kind of mind boggling to me, just in the sense of like, you would think at that level, you maybe finally feel like, oh, like I know a lot more than other people, but he still was trying to mine every interaction to learn more. And like, that was a very powerful sort of moment or experience of just realizing like, the reason why the best stay the best 
is they stay curious. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important thing. Yeah, he, um, so I've worked for, I'm going to go all big time now, you know, Thunder Bay guy. I, I work for three billionaires. Um, oh, wow. So of the, of the three billionaires that I work for, he, he is, I wouldn't say by far the, the, the hardest worker. They all work their ass off. But this guy is like, he is deliberate beyond, like beyond anyone could be. I think I, in his house at the Hamptons, there's a sign on the, on the gate that says, if you're here, go back to the office. Like he's like, a, I'm serious. It's like a little plaque. And you know, his, he, I, I think the first time that I had a conversation with him, it was brief, but it was like, like you said, it was a conversation. It wasn't, you know, one way. And um, you know, he, he's like, how many days on the road, uh, how many days of the year are you on the road seeing companies? Like, just like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, I don't know, I, but the number better be high. I think he would be like 250 days. You know, the guy is all over the world learning, 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 learning. That, that is a, that's a very good answer. And it's somebody that, um, you know, he's not my buddy or anything like that. I mean, I, I did leave, but um, it is. <laughs> No, but he, he's built a fantastic, uh, a fantastic yeah. company and a partnership. And again, he's he's one of he's a billionaire in in, in finance, and he's a lawyer. You know, he's not yeah. like it wasn't his, his his central. I guess you wouldn't have guessed that that was his central training. And that's also quite unique to um, to a lot of these people that you've um, that you've talked about and, and wrote about in your book. Let's um, let's go to these uh, questions if you if you don't mind. Um, um, what it, this is interesting, from Ashley from uh, Minnesota, and if you do pop your name in there, it, it's helpful to us. We, we, we really appreciate knowing where everybody's from. The Hedge Eye Nation continues to grow strong. I love, uh, I love Minnesota. Uh, what did you find was the most interesting fact or insight in researching your book, if there is one? By the way, I like, I like the person doing um, online shopping right behind you. Um, the person... <laughs> um, I got to move. Person... <laughs> that's our, like it's just merch. That's our, merch. It's head eye merch. It's fine. No, that's our new. Uh, like he's a new guy. He doesn't. He doesn't. Oh, okay. He'll figure it out. He'll learn. He'll learn. <laughs> um, so I think the I think the insight that to me was sort of most interesting throughout the entire the entire sort of process was that the more more successful people were, the more they thought creativity was learnable. That's sort of this paradox of like. When I would talk to people who are sort of mid-level, they were like, mm, it's impossible, it's all magic. But the people who had reached world-class success, they were the biggest believers in the fact that anyone could do it. Oh. And to me, that was a very telling thing because those are the people who've reflected the most, who've worked the most and achieved the most. They also were the ones, and there's this, I think it's a Michael Jordan quote, it might be a Kobe quote, but basically saying like the idea of saying just I'm talented is offensive, right? It's like. No, like I showed up in the gym before all of my teammates. I practice hours longer than them. So yes, I like have natural advantages, but I also put in way more work and just saying I'm talented is actually offensive. And I thought that idea was really interesting. Well, because the, the core to a lot of these people, like try saying that to David Rubenstein. I mean, like again, yeah. it's, it's the work ethic and the deliberate and repetitive and disciplined nature yeah, of these people. Yeah, that's all, yeah. That's a huge thing, again, I don't have to say it too many more times. I mean, you go from ungradable at, at a school to writing every day and people actually want to read it. You know, I do you believe change. that because you can. You can, you can definitely improve. Um, let's go to this. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions in here. And what I love about this, uh, Alan, is that this is what I don't talk to people about every day, which is uh, I'm learning on the fly here, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> do, do, you, do, you ascribe any ch um, do you ascribe any credence sorry, to the to substances fueling legendary creativity. For example, and of course they're gonna mention Steve Jobs with LSD, Freud with cocaine, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, I talk about this in the book. There's some interesting neuroscience and creativity that it's kind of cliche to talk about left brain, right brain, but it's actually pretty important to how creativity yeah, works. And there's a good. lot of science valid validity to it. But basically our left brain is sort of our logical loud brain is how I like to think about it. And our right hemisphere is where creativity happens, but it's also works that sort of a quieter volume. And so this is why people experience aha moments like in the shower, on your commute, on a walk. It's not that like your shower tile is like so inspiring. It's that those are moments when your left hemisphere is just like the volumes turned down. So you can hear what's been going on in your right hemisphere. And so the thing is like alcohol and drugs and all these things have traditionally been tied to creativity because these are all things that suppress your left hemisphere. So like, yes, you can like do drugs and be more creative, but you can also like go on a walk. Yeah, and that, that, there, so there's this book um, that I've, 
I'm trying to, it was called Stealing Fire. Um, mm. And Kotler, I think, wrote it. And it's, and it's a really good, um, for, first of all, that's not how I roll. So I was like really interested in this. Like are all these people like tripping, like quite literally going to Burning Man and going to a place that, you know, pick LSD, for example, you know, to, to get where they need to get. You know, I was shocked, a little bit shocked at least. And, and it is part of like how people feel like they need, they, they feel like they need to get there. Yeah, and it's really interesting because you look at a lot of these people and there's tons of people who have these sort of famous experiences, right? We think about Steve Jobs with LSD, Elon Musk talks about experimenting with this stuff, right? But then there's also lots and lots of people who don't. And so I think like part of the issue when it comes to like creativity is the sort of mythologizing, I'm mispronouncing that, of these figures into these greater than life, like look how wild or look how crazy they were. And like, yeah, like Steve Jobs famously did like acid like once, maybe twice in his 20s, but like he wasn't doing it every Thursday before a board meeting, you know? And so I think that that stuff, there is truth to it. There is validity to these substances will allow you to experience different things. I just don't think it's essential. Yeah, I mean, essential would be, yeah, that'd be a little out there. But again, just opera, and that's the whole point of, of that book is that we're in the early stages of understanding how you might use some of that to augment your thinking. I can tell you right now, because I drink, I mean, I, 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 I come up with absolutely no good ideas when that's happening. I mean, there's nothing going on. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's a little different in terms of a depressant, by the way. Um, I think I'm okay on that. Uh, anyway, uh, moving along. Uh, <laughs> how would you, uh, this is uh, from Mike in Durango, Colorado. Uh, how would you recommend, Alan, evaluating the deliberateness of one's practice? Mm, this is a great question. So. First of all, I would take a quick Google of deliberate practice or purposeful practice. Those are the two sort of terms they use interchangeably, and there's a lot of really good resources out there. But the fundamental thing is you look for whatever you're trying to learn, you wanna look for a training program that's about the fundamentals and the basics. So like example, if you want to learn photography, there's photography programs that are really focused on learning individually all of the fundamentals not just saying let's go to a park and take pictures and critique them so what you want to do is really find things that are about breaking down the big into the small and those will be the most effective forms of training yeah that you know there's you know who darius dale is right Quad yes. Qu yeah, yeah. quadzilla you know quadzilla wasn't a math guy until he started working with me and there's this place called the khan academy where i'm like dude learn calculus and <laughs> and he what he did is far more impressive awesome. than, than my writing, uh, st my story about you know, graduating to being able to write something that's comprehensive. For him, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, obviously. This is like for him to be where he's at, you know, he, he's, you know, the things that he's built in his mathematical mind over a relatively short period of time uh, is all about learning and teaching himself the basics. If he didn't teach himself the basics, he wouldn't have been able to, you know, to iterate the way that he has. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I, totally. I, that's I, awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, he um he was not um he was not a math guy before uh, he came to Hedgeye, and now he's one of the best there is. Uh, and he and, and we've met with some you know when you meet with people on Wall Street, they're like the fundamentals, fundamentalists, and the quants, and you know he can he can he can hold his own with any quant. Um, I might add, uh, Alan, do you have any opinions on who has the best? Cre I, mean, I don't know. What it is. Do you have any opinions on who has the best creative process, living or dead? Uh, I'm a huge fan of Pixar from a sort of corporate oh, yeah. creativity process. They, and I think what's cool about Pixar is you had this massive A-B test where, um, and there's a book called Creativity Inc. where Ed yeah. Catmull, the co-founder of Pixar, talks about their process. But it's a very structured innovation process that's all about building psychological safety on their creative teams, which is a whole concept we could talk for hours about. And the thing which is really cool, though, is that when Disney bought Pixar, what they did was Disney animation at the time was like abysmal. And they took Ed Catmull and John Lasseter and said, okay, we want you to come over and we want you to take the Pixar process and bring it to Disney. We're not gonna merge the animation studios. We want you to bring the process over. And like, we all know what happens next. If you have kids or nieces or nephews, Disney animation is like wildly successful now. And so it's just such a powerful example of proving that their innovation process that was actually unique about Pixar that allowed them to then mirror that success at Disney. That's interesting. You know, the Bob Iger book, which I um, reviewed however many months back when it, when it came out, Ride of a Lifetime, I think it's called. Um, mm -hmm. In his book, and I'd already read Creativity Inc., and I agree with that, that, that I was like, 
of course that's the way that you do it. Like it's like the Ben and Jerry <laughs> thing. It's it's like these things didn't come out of, of nowhere. And Iger did what you said, which is he was not afraid to acknowledge that that was the weak point that he needed to bring into his yeah. platform. I mean, he was auto like we're we're buying you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what a fantastic decision by by a leader to to understand, like you say, their weak spots spots and turn it into a, a strength. Um, you know, I think a lot of people say that about Iger. I don't know if you've studied him at all or, or you have any views on him. I, just, and, and I read the book. And that, I read the book and that was one of my takeaways too, is this is a guy who like, even though he's so charismatic, he seems very self-aware, which is just a very powerful force multiplier when you're in a position that has that much leverage. Yeah, I mean, tremendous amount of leverage. And you, know, you see CEOs and that's maybe why the, um, you know, the average tenure of an S&P 500 CEO, Alan, is like 4.3 years. And and, and, and and that is because it's really hard to be a Bob Iger. It's hard to stay Bob yeah. Iger. And because a lot of CEOs, and I see this particularly in our business, they, they're, they're about themselves, right? So they can't quite find a way to empower the team and, and they, they're, they're staying power as a result. Their leadership um, is, is, is short lived. It happens in professional coaching too. You'll see that a certain kind of a coach can have impact in the one, two or years with a new team. And then all of a sudden year three, you're not you're not telling me anything new because um, they're not really collaborating. So that's um, I, I see that a lot in coaching. All right, um, some more questions here. Uh, let's see, we have yeah, we still have some time. Um, let's see here. Apologies for that. Um, this is a question I guess for both of us from Bill in Virginia. <laughs> um, Cam and Alan, what particular elements of Alan's book can you relate to regarding the idea, uh, execution, and commercial success of Hedgeye? Well, um, I'd love to hear your answer on that because you don't have to say it's a success. I'm obviously going to say that I'm trying to be successful. So maybe you go first. <laughs> um, well, the thing I, I thought was really interesting about what you do is this idea of like, I'm a non-finance person, but I find this stuff intellectually interesting. And so for me, like what I thought was really cool was the sort of the metaphors you use in describing what Hedgeye is, right? It's like, imagine you can see like behind the scenes that like, you know, one of these, you know, big analysts, it's like, that's really interesting. And so like, I subscribed to a couple of your products and like, that's why, um, you know, we ended up connecting and like, fundamentally, like that to me as a non-finance person was really intellectually interesting. And I'm sure like, I don't know the whole story of Hedgeye, but I'm sure it hasn't been a you know, straight shot, but like over time, as you develop more products and as people become more comfortable with them, you can then start to come out with more and more products because then you're a familiar face and then you can be that sort of brand that comes out. And so I think there's a lot of great examples when you're building any company, but I think it's true for you too. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. The, um, you know, the first two things in your four laws, if you will, like consumption I already gave you the wrap on that, imitation I already acknowledged that. I think to me, the most important part of your book that really resonates with what I'm doing today, which matters most for you know, what, you know, Hedgeye becomes tomorrow is really that deliberate practice, you know, the, the ongoing, um, you know, doing of the doing and then getting <laughs> to the, to, to the creative community part. Like to me, my challenge is to bridge that gap, like to get more people, you know, to get more people that aren't in the business of finance, but care about their, all the hardworking capital that, that, that they've been successful to, uh, to have in their accounts and, and protect and preserve that capital. Like that's a big bridge for me and it's going to take, you know, I have to, I have to be creative with metaphors to get people um, <laughs> ready to listen. Um, but I, I, I find that if I lean more on the community, Alan, I do better than if I come up with my own way that I think it should, could, or would be. The community is very powerful. I mean, try chirping me on Twitter. You get run over by Hedgeye Nation <laughs> or Hedgeye Mob, right? I mean, they're, they're rabbits, some of them, uh, which is great. I love yeah. that. But that, that to me is something that I'm going to, you know, if I have to do something, if, if I don't do something rather, if this fails from here, it will be because I ignored uh, the community and what they want next. Totally. And I think that's true. I mean, I always think like the crowd is sort of so powerful because in the world we live in today, it's like there could be audiences where your ideas deeply resonate and you would never have predicted that. Right. And so right. it's like this book, for example, is like, I'm, I don't, I'm going to say a word that I don't mean in a bad way, but it's like weirdly or maybe surprisingly like very, very popular in Korea. And like, I wouldn't have <laughs> guessed that. But it turns out Korea has this whole culture around creativity as a form of rebellion against their sort of like parents, the sort of like more rigid norms. And so there's been this big creativity boon in Korea the last few years. And like, I, I when I was writing a book on creativity, like I had no idea, right? But like, 
I've since gone to Korea, I've leaned into it, right? And so like you sometimes just have to be willing to listen to where the market is. Yeah, willing to listen is, a, is, a, is an ongoing theme in your work. Um, here's, here's another one. Um, how do you break down your writing process? This is interesting. Uh, how do you break down your writing process and do you draw from different behavioral tendencies when writing and researching? Yeah, so for me, and I'd be curious for you, but for me, I'm like a very heavy outliner. So like my brain is kind of simplistic where it's like, I'm in sort of like research mode, I'm in outlining mode, I'm in writing mode, I'm in editing mode. I'm not one of those people who can like just sit down and start writing. Like I have to develop my entire argument. Uh, and so my process is very, very sequential. Um, but what that allows me to do is in each step of that process, I work on getting better and better at it. So I constantly am thinking like, how do I become a better researcher? How do I become better at building arguments and outlining? How do I write better prose? How do I more effectively edit? And I think by having that structure, you can then start to think about the individual elements of the structure. But how about you? Yeah, well, me, I, I, I mean, this, this notebook is the subject matter for tomorrow. So every mm. bloody day for 21 years, one day, <laughs> that was yesterday, this is today, tomorrow has got nothing on it yet other than the tickers. <laughs> Every day, you can come in my office and you'll see all these notebooks. They, awesome. They're all lined up, and I go back and I also study them. You know where I was, where I went wrong. You know, there's a deliberate study mm. to learning from your mistakes too. If you don't make mistakes, you're never going to learn anything. Um, so, so that to me, I what, I can write it pretty quick. Actually, I can write my that that early look I write between takes me 40 to 50 minutes um, because awesome. because all the numbers are and the outlines are already in front of me and and if I can't explain it simply, I think I'm full of shit anyway. So, but I think that's. That'll that also gets to another point that I think is valuable for people is that like one of the big things with creativity is you have to figure out what works well for you and is sustainable. Like yeah. I could, would you do? I couldn't do. I have terrible handwriting. Like I would just be a mess all the time. Right. <laughs> and so I think for a lot of people, they, they seek advice on like, like, okay, like, you know, should I write a thousand words a day or like, you know, whatever. And I think it's like figure out for you, what is that thing that you could actually do over and over again and lean into that? Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Okay, here's uh, from Scooter in Detroit. I've never heard of this. Are, are you, Alan, are you aware of the jobs to be done framework? If so, does finding the job people are trying to do but cannot supplement your thinking for fit into your process um, oriented thinking? Have you ever heard so of it? So I am familiar with the jobs to be done framework. I have never thought of it in context of this framework. So like I would say that the element of that that's probably familiar. So for those, so jobs to be done is this idea of that when you're buying a product or a service, people are hiring the product to do a job for them. And it's a way of sort of simplifying or reducing down sort of all of the features and benefits of something and making it much more straightforward. And I think what I like about that is when you think about any product, fundamentally that's about also getting to a level of language that is familiar for people to actually grasp onto. So I think about that familiarity novelty thing, like I see, I come from the startup world and like a lot of startups are like, we do these like radical crazy things that like have this theoretical benefit. And most consumers are like, I just want my email to work, you know? And like, so I think it's important when we use language as a tool for refining our ideas, because if we can effectively explain things, it often means that our ideas are accessible enough for other people to actually want them. Good, all right, last uh, one of the last questions here. Um, and there's a lot of questions about the, this deliberate practice and how you define it. Um, and again, the, the, their uh, book, actually it's Erickson's book, Peak, you know, that, yep. that, that I think you already cited. Um, I've cited that book many, many times. So there, there's, there's plenty of literature for you to, there are plenty of books that Alan draws on, by the way, there are plenty of obviously human beings that he's drawing from. Again, like, like me, he's standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants here. Um, but on this deliberate study, is it just a focused mindset or is there more to it mm -hmm. than that is the question? Yeah. So. It's not just a focused mindset. There's a couple things that are interesting. One is, um, so I interviewed Erickson for my book and like, you know, he's, he's really brilliant and he's smart and he's nice. But one thing he sort of pointed out, which you then find there's a lot of substance and research behind is that um, anyone who achieves world-class level of talent, they were instructed at some point in their career by someone who is world-class themselves. And this explains a lot of why there's like structural inequality in a lot of, you know, creative fields where it's like if you want to become great at piano, it's really hard if you don't come from a rich kid background because like how are you going to afford the best teachers, how are you going to have access to them? 
What I think is exciting or I think it's interesting about sort of the world we live in now, like you're talking about Khan Academy and stuff, is that more people have access to world-class teachers than ever before. So I think if you want to engage in deliberate practice in a way which is really intentional and becoming truly world-class, you're in this sort of unique moment in time where that's no longer something that has a lot of gatekeepers. Like you can literally do that from home with people in an you know, entirely other, other continent. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right, last question. Like if, if there is one person that you could interview next or just have a, have a conversation with that you haven't had one with, who would it be? Uh, Shonda Rhimes. I mean, she is, you know, she is behind so much of the most successful television in like history. She's so like, she's, she's so repeatedly successful across different genres across time. And anyone who's that good at keeping up with the trends, I'm like very, very fascinated by. Yeah. I, I that's a great answer. I, I would, I would go with Howard Stern. Like, you know, oh, I like that. Like I, I, to me, like, I just, I, I, he he's said, such a good interview. He's, he stayed on your on your curve for a very long period of time. Like for somebody to be a media presence and, and certainly one with a following like he has, I mean, for he just he, he's he's just amazing. Is there have you ever, yeah. have, you, have you studied him at all or have you had a conversation with him? I haven't, but like he's a great example where it's like to your point, it's like he has like stood the test of time and become a classic, and like he has gone through sort of iterations of himself. But they're not radical, right? He's gone through these, he can go on serious and does these things and like, but like, yeah, he's really interesting. I should, I should, I should study him. You gave me some homework. I like it. I guess my last question on this and, uh, and thank you for, for making so much time here uh, is, is like, can you avoid just being yourself? <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that's the fundamental thing is like as humans, like if we try to not be ourselves, what you end up doing is you end up running yourself ragged, you end up not being successful. And the key to a lot of this at the end of the day is learning a lot about yourself and then building structures and systems around who you are in order to maximize what you have, not try and be someone you're not. That's great advice, I love that. Because I don't have a choice, I have to keep being me, and so do you. Uh, so he's, he's Alan Gannett. Please, you gotta get, you gotta get this book and, uh, and you gotta pay attention. On Twitter too, at, you, how'd you get that ha handle? Alan, it's awesome. It's old, old man name, it's helpful. Yeah, I, old man name, well, Keith is uh, the name, I got named after Keith, like off the days of our lives, Keith, like you know, as a, as a soap okay, opera that's that a, is yeah. probably dating a lot of people. So again, we both have creative names, I suppose, but older. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks for making the time. I, I really appreciate it, and I, I think the audience did too.